So, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm pleased to introduce Derek Kozel, Mike Whiskey Zero Lima, November Alpha, whose lecture to us this morning is on the subject of digital homebrewing and schematics of SDR. Electronic kits are wonderful, but what are what about kits for software? Well, we'll take a tour of some of the projects and tools, and with a particular emphasis on digital signal processing. Please welcome Derek Kozel. Thank you. If you'll just hold a moment, I will uh, mirror my display so I can actually see what I'm talking about, uh, which is always valuable when giving a talk. Uh, the other good lesson is always update your talk abstracts. When I set a particular emphasis on uh, DSP, uh, this talk is going to be entirely about digital signal processing, so hopefully that uh, meets everyone's uh, hopes. Here we are. F5. Yeah. So wonderful. Um, yes, indeed. I am Derek, MW0LNA, also K0ZEL. As you may have noticed, I'm not always, I am not from around here originally. I'm from California. I uh, moved over to Cardiff a couple of years ago and happily now resident here in the UK. And uh, got licensed a couple of years back here at the convention. So it's fun to finally be coming and giving my first talk here. Uh, I'll be talking about software-defined radio. Uh, can I get a quick show of hands? Who's heard of software-defined radio? <laughs> Good. Who owns a software-defined radio? I have no idea why you're in this room. This is an introductory talk. Um, but hopefully I will, over the course of the talk, introduce you to a few new tools that you may not have already encountered. I, I will try not to get too far ahead of myself, but uh, this is basically the kind of standard outline of what a software-defined radio looks like. Sorry, the font isn't great. The slides will be available afterwards, I'm sure, in one way or another. Uh, I don't know why they label it as a smart antenna. I think that's probably uh, over-ambition on uh, this particular illustration. But you have an antenna. You have flexible RF hardware, uh, otherwise known generally as a broadband receiver, broadband transmitter uh, for most applications. and I, an ADC, an analog to digital converter, going on the receive side, and a digital to analog converter. So with most of the radios uh, of traditional <coughs> architectures, hardware-defined radios, the portion here with the antenna, the RF hardware, uh, and then the transition to further processing, whether that's audio processing or um, just straight out uh, to in some digital form, that's the majority of your radio. In an SDR, that's still an extremely valuable portion of the radio. You can't cheat physics here. You still need a decent antenna, decent filtering, and LNA still gives you lower noise performance. Still a very valuable block of hardware. But then there's all this new stuff. And this is an area where amateur radio operators have done a lot of amazing work to date, but I think it's been done by a very small percentage of hams. And it's something that I'd love to see more people tinkering with and bodging with and doing a terrible job but having a lot of fun with, uh, all the way to producing fantastic commercial products uh, like we've seen. So uh, they say channelization and sample rate conversion. Really, they're just saying the digital front end. This could be a digital intermediate frequency, so you could have kind of a pseudo heterodyne receiver here. And then they generically label this processing. And that's going to be basically what I'm talking about. And they say you can do it in hardware with FPGAs. We see things um, like the Lime SDR, the Blade RF, uh, a lot of these software-defined radio kits uh, that we are able to buy do have these field programmable gate arrays. These are basically programmable hardware. You can write in software, in code, a description of what logic you would like implemented inside of an FPGA, and then deploy that software out to your radio, and all of a sudden you have you know, the, majority, the really uh, compute-heavy portion of something like DVB-S2 that we see on Oscar 100. DSPs, so that's classical hardware digital signal processors. We see these on things like the Flex Radio. Um, I know I'm pretty confident that they have a powerful Texas Instruments hardware digital signal processor on there that's still doing digital signal processing. 
but it's, it's a discrete chip for that. And then ASICs, custom silicon chips that are implementing some steps. That ends up being things like um, with uh, AMBE, the voice codec in um, DSTAR and uh, DMR. That ends up having to be implemented in a specific chip because it's a proprietary protocol. It's, it's patented and licensed. And so if you want DSTAR support, you need to buy this particular chip or an approved uh, software stack from it. So that's the hardware portion. I'm not going to talk a huge amount about that at all. Then you get into software. And this is what we traditionally think of as SDR within this room. You have some radio. You plug it in via USB, you know, something like that. And all of a sudden, you have a whole bunch of, of samples arriving at your computer. What the heck do you do with it? You shove it into a piece of software, and out comes your audio or your video or your data stream. And that's a bunch of algorithms. They name some very specific ones in this image. But basically, it's, it's a bunch of software. So like I said, there's still lots of important analog portions. And this is an area where there's been a huge amount of homebrew. If you go downstairs uh, right now and into the um, groups area, you'll see a bunch of people who have taken SDRs and then spent a long time on the analog section because it's really valuable. Uh, but in my mind, a lot of the key and very interesting parts are written in software. And that's some or all of the demodulation and modulation. It's a bunch of the filtering, the audio processing, packet handling. Uh, you know, everything that really makes a specific mode will be implemented in software for, for the types of hardware that we're dealing with. So what's it implemented in? It's digital signal processing. You're doing math operations on recordings of voltage values. That's really what the, um, the samples are within the IQ realm, the imaginary and uh, in phase components. Uh, so usually these are very, very standard patterns. Uh, we see this in uh, hardware circuitry and analog circuitry. You know, what's this? I'm sure somebody in the room knows what this arrangement of capacitors and inductors is. Shout out. It's a filter. Yes. So is this. This is the digital version of that filter. Uh, and it's marked up you know, in a standard format for digital signal processing. If you're not familiar with each of these individual components, you could say the same thing about a programmer coming to radio for the first time, to electronics for the first time. I don't know what this symbol is. What, it, what is this squiggly line with an L on it? Totally confused. If you look at this, though, you can see uh, this is the standard notation for a signal coming in. So just like we have V input, you have X sample index N. This is saying we have some discrete time sample to uh, signal coming in. We're going to delay it, Z minus 1, by one sample. Let's do some operation, take the same input, delay it by 1 do some input again, and add the two together, sigma for summation. Blah, 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 bunch of stages, and you get some output signal. This is called a imp uh, finite impulse response filter. You don't need to know how it works, as long as you kind of see that in the analog realm, we have circuits uh, and schematics. In the digital signal processing realm, we have the same thing. But if I asked you what frequency does that bandpass filter work at, you can't tell me. There's no component labels. We don't know what the values are. It's the same thing with DSP. If you don't know the values of these Bs here, these coefficients, you can't say what the filter response is going to be. All of those specific values are stored in the code. And sometimes there's custom operations, uh, like the AMBE uh, codec, where we don't know, you know, they've mixed and matched a bunch of these standard operations, and they've come up with a specific voice codec. And sometimes they, they find new and interesting ways of doing the processing. So if you don't know DSP or you, know, you just want something to work, there's a whole suite of SDR applications that are basically the pre-built radios of SDR. You know, this is you buy the hardware, you plug it in, you want to operate. Totally reasonable expectation. Uh, I've just listed a few examples. There are more than would fit on this slide easily and more than would fit in this 45 minutes. Uh, SDR Angel is my go-to software right now for I just want to operate FM, single sideband, slow scan TV, whatever I want to operate, SDR Angel pretty much has it implemented. 
it's written by a ham. I really should have included his call sign in this. I will try and pull up the help menu, and hopefully he's given himself the, the credit that he deserves in the software. Uh, it's a full-featured, nice, easy-to-use application that's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Stunningly good work. Uh, GQRX, Lean DVB, Soda Radio are examples of applications which maybe don't have quite exactly the same level of polish, but which each implement a really valuable set of DSP uh, that allow us to operate different modes using different SDRs. Um, so I'll pull up SDR Angel right now and uh, give you a look at that. Though apparently, I turned it off. Uh, not that one. So I'm, I'm launching things using the command line just because that's how I can, that's how I sort things. This absolutely has a desktop launcher as well. So don't let that turn you off. Uh, come on. So it's listing out basically all the hardware devices that it supports. And here we go, the software. Uh, so we can see, sorry, things are a little blurry. You can see up in the corner what frequency I'm tuned to. I'm in the ISM band uh, because I originally wrote this slide deck with music and decided not to uh, entice Ofcom at all. Um, you're able to change the sample rate. This is going to end up being how wide of a bandwidth you can receive using the radio. Uh, and if I... Uh, down in this receiver zero, it says RTL SDR. That's one of the radios I have plugged in. Let's get some spectrum. Let's not get some spectrum. Why can't we get some spectrum? Because it doesn't see the RTL anymore. This is the hazard of running both a hardware and software demo. Uh, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, not going to cooperate. I. We'll try relaunching that just once um, in the hopes that it does pick it up. But if not, I have a couple other pieces of software to show. SDR Angel's just great. I'm really impressed. I hadn't visited it again in the last year or so because I've been basically off the air moving houses and trying to get anything set up. Uh, are you going to cooperate? Ooh, yes. Thank you. Uh, so we're looking at 2 megahertz of spectrum here approximately from uh, 432 megahertz up to 434 megahertz. Uh, there's no antenna connected, so not much is coming through. Um, but I basically just wanted to show that uh, there's kind of the standard uh, instantaneous uh, signal plot here. So this will show the power, if there was a signal, exactly how much power there is at each frequency. And then we have the waterfall plot that I'm sure kind of everyone in this room is really familiar with. Uh, these are both particularly well implemented ones. So you the plot on the top allows you to see uh, very, very quick, instantaneous bursts. It has what they, I am pretty sure that this implementation has what they say, call 100% uh, probability of intercept for anything that's longer in duration than the sample rate. So they're taking all of the data and they're doing a um, phosphor type display that you would see on a spectrum analyzer where they're in a real time spectrum analyzer. Uh, so if a signal shows up, it will be displayed which is really cool for chasing down fast frequency hopping things and uh, other signals that are really hard to capture with other software. There's a whole drop-down list of demodulators here. Um, and if I put down a transmitter, it would show me the list of modulators. Uh, just quickly going through it, because I'm sure the back row can't read, there's AM, amateur t uh, analog TV, broadcast FM. There's a channel analyzer if you want to do some uh, more metrology type things. Uh, DATV. Uh, digital signal decoding, uh, that's a separate application that allows you to do P25 and a bunch of the other digital modes um, that aren't so common in the amateur realm, but which this software does support. Uh, FreeDV, awesome uh, digital voice mode that's seeing inroads on HF and uh, VHF at the moment. Uh, LoRa, which some people may have heard of, very popular in the uh, Internet of Things realm. Narrowband FM, single sideband, uh, and then uh, a wideband FM and a UDP channel sync that lets you export these samples out to another application. Uh, very useful for you know, when this software doesn't do what you need. We can see that there is a narrowband demodulator. Uh, I'll return to this later on in the talk, um, but it's, it has configurable bandwidth for the receive and stuff like that, volume. You can set a CT, CSS, tone, 
Uh, so it's really, you know, the whole kitchen sinks in here. It's uh, tremendously impressive. Please have given yourself credit. Yes. Uh, so it's Edward Griffiths, uh, F4 EXB. He's on Twitter. He has a website. This guy's amazing. Uh, really great work. Stop. OK. I, so that is an example of a pre-built SDR application. I'm sure that other people in this room have seen other ones. Uh, I do have a reason why I chose uh, this specific subset, but I'll get to that later on in the talk. Uh, SDR utilities. So the is very unhelpful. SDR utilities. Uh, these are kind of, I think of these more as the test equipment of SDR. This is where you don't need a full, complete mode implemented. You really have some unknown signal and you want to start tearing it apart. This is your multimeter. This is you know, a spectrum analyzer type application. Uh, and two that I mentioned here are in Spectrum and Uber Radio Hacker. Uh, the latter is quite good for digital signals. So if you ever see um, like some signal that's come in band, it's digital. Uh, you're trying to figure out <laughs> who on earth is transmitting on the you know, 70 sems band or something like that. Uh, if you can take a recording of it, this is a great tool for, for tearing it apart. I'm going to do a quick demo with Inspectrum. I, I don't know whether the author of Inspectrum is actually uh, here in the room. No. He was at the convention last year. Uh, and again, I'm having just a wild blank at the front of the stage and should have put names here. Um, I believe that was Mike who, who wrote that. Uh, which directory am I in? RSGB19. <laughs> no, let's start with the FSK demo. Uh, there we are. So this is a signal. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. And zoom in a little. So up at the top, we can see the signal. So this is sampled at 250 kilosamples per second. So we're getting 250 kilohertz worth of bandwidth. Clearly, our signal of interest doesn't take up nearly that much. But we have some frequency shift keyed signal here with two different levels. So already, we know a huge amount about this signal um, without you know, knowing anything about what's transmitting. If we go into the time selection area and enable cursors, we can see basically what this, the period is here, what the, the symbol rate is. And if we line up the cursors nicely with the edges here, uh, we can see that this is, has a rate of 355 hertz. Uh, so 355 baud. Uh, I think that if you get this exactly lined up, it ends up being 390 uh, as the true value. Um, but we're already pretty close to what the symbol rate is for this. But, you know, this, you know, I, I don't want to be here printing this out with pen and paper, drawing these lines and saying, ah, oh, it's 1010001. Uh, if you right click on the software, you can add a derived plot. And the options you get are uh, sample plot, so it's just what are the samples within a certain window. Um, this is the same thing as decimating and doing a frequency shift for those who. Uh, a little bit uh, snappier with the DSP. Uh, or you can add an amplitude, frequency, or phase plot, our three fundamental properties of, of a signal. Now, if you have something that's audio and phase keyed, uh, you're going to end up stacking it up and having to do more things manually. But in this case, we know that this is just a, a frequency shift um, here. And if we zoom in, we can see really nicely our signals. And, you know, because it's a fairly simple signal, uh, we can see that it's just uh, basically a replication of what we can visually see here. But now we actually have a digital trace that we can deal with. And we can export these out to a file if we wanted to do processing. But looking at this, how many different values you know, of can the signal take here? Two. Uh, so that allows us to do a really nice, simple, uh, we can add a derived plot on our already derived frequency plot for a threshold plot. And it does the nice little work of us of turning this into ones and zeros. 
at this point, you can extract those symbols to you know, copy out to a clipboard, paste it in, and now your manual process of going, OK, now I have my ones and zeros. What do these mean? The software doesn't take you further than that. Uh, Uber Radio Hacker does have those additional next steps. So if you had something like um, the FSK beacons that we have on a lot of the microwave bands, if you, out of interest, wanted to reverse engineer one of those or sit there with the protocol spec and, and see, ah, what beacon am I looking at? Can I understand all of the steps in the demodulation here? This gets you, you know, the, the really awkward first N percent of the way there. Uh, doing this actual receiving in digital signal processing takes, takes a bit of time. It's well worth learning. It's something else that you can do uh, in GNU Radio, which is one of the toolkits I'm going to show next. Uh, but this is a really quick and easy way of, of getting that first, first inroads on it. So that's in Spectrum. This is going to restart, but that's why we have this. So those are SDR utilities. Now what is all of this? This is, it's all code. It's all software. Um, and you're processing signals using math rather than analog components, like I said back at the beginning, basically. Uh, you're using the standard patterns with specific values. And unlike analog components, you can't desolder and measure these or try and measure them in circuit. It's often very hard to reverse engineer exactly the parameters in the software. It's possible. There's people who've done it. There's different ways of tearing apart binary applications. But nobody's got time for that. Um, it's so much nicer when you actually have the source code. Uh, so when there are specific custom operations, like noise reduction or specific modulations, if you have the source code, you can then go in and say, huh. Your noise blanker is nice, but actually I want it to have a little bit of a faster attack angle, or I know that there's going to be something here that's custom to my setup. I'd like to tweak that. Uh, if you don't have the source code, you can't change those things. Um, I put up the noise reduction actually specifically as an aside, uh, because when I was first going to choose my HF rig, I wanted something that had a lot of these features. It was using digital signal processing. I wanted something I could plug in a USB cable and you know, get the, the cat commands uh, to and from different pieces of software to the radio to do auto tuning. And I wanted to be able to get voice streaming in and out using the USB cable rather than having one of those great big, uh, I think it's the rig blasters uh, modules that you can get there and six different cables to your HF rig. And all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's quite the mess. Uh, and so I was looking through all the manuals, uh, and I ended up with uh, Kenwood. And they had an amazing in-depth manual that described all their digital signal processing steps at a high level, uh, which was already more than I found with basically any of the other uh, vendors at the time. This was years ago. Uh, and they said, ah, we have noise reduction. Here's a before and after plot. I said, ooh, that looks really, really interesting. How are you doing it? Nothing. Uh, there's no information online about exactly what algorithm they're using, and there's no ability to go in and change it. Now, you can just disable it, take the audio out to your, your computer, and you can start playing with software like Audacity or other audio processing programs, and, and you can get noise reduction. But I always thought it would be really, really nice if you could actually go into the radio and, and understand exactly what was going on. And right now, it's just a completely black, it is a literal black box. Uh, with the analog side, you know, they publish the full schematics. You can go in and you can tweak and reverse engineer. If you're not happy with the frequency stability, you can take out the oscillator and you can put in an external 10 megahertz reference and be very, very happy that your HF is now a tenth of a hertz off, uh, which, which for some modes does make a difference and for other modes is wildly unnecessary. But uh, it's, it's good fun. And, you know, I, I love that homebrew aspect of the hobby. So SDR toolkits. This is where we really get to play with these fundamental building blocks of software-defined radio. Uh, they're available in nearly every programming language. And when I s start talking about programming languages, that light bulb you know, should be lighting up. This is generally something that you need to learn a little bit about programming for. And you're going to have to learn a little bit of programming, a little bit of digital signal processing. I'm hoping that I can show that the on-ramp 
starts at a really low point and can be gentle going up at least the first bit uh, before you start getting into the intricacies, just like electronics. You, know, you can put an LED, a battery, a switch, and a resistor on there, and just like in the intermediate license, turn on and off your, your bulb and, and understand what's <laughs> going on. Then when somebody says, please design me a VHF rig with you know, full modulation, you go, ha, 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 ha. I don't think that was covered in the intermediate license. Um, but you know, this is a community that enjoys self-learning. Uh, so two applications that I'll show here are the Scikit DSP-COM. Uh, this is a Python library. This is very much getting nitty gritty down with the details. The <laughs> examples that I have are the ones that come with the library. They're, they're very, very uh, in-depth and very math heavy on the front end. There are simpler examples, I just don't have them included. Uh, and there's online references and a book that they published that has, has basically lab-based tutorials and stuff like that. It was designed for university, but I think there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And then GNU Radio is the one I'm most personally involved with. Uh, it's the one I'll demonstrate most if I have time. I haven't been quite keeping track. Uh, and it's the one that I generally recommend to people getting started off with. So GNU Radio, this slide is mostly in there as a reference for people coming back later. Uh, GNU Radio.org is the website to go to, and it has links to um, different manuals and help pages. And very soon it'll have a downloads page, so you don't have to hunt through and, and try and find the installer. My apologies that that hasn't been there years ago. So this is what GNU Radio looks like, and let's go to a way simpler demo to start off with. And there is no Zoom functionality. Am I going to completely destroy the video if I change resolutions? Yeah, I won't do that. Uh, there is actually, I remember this. I found this the other day while giving a different conversation. There's an accessibility toolkit in Ubuntu Linux, which is wonderful, and it has a zoom option. Prepared completely. Uh, so this is the graphical user interface for GNU Radio. Uh, it's called GNU Radio Companion. Uh, this should be a, a first initial hint that GNU Radio is a toolkit for programmers. It is entirely a software uh, application, er, software library at the bottom. Then there's this companion layered on top, meant to make it much easier for you to develop initial applications and even full applications using a graphical environment because not all of us just live in a world where we want lots of pain. I, so this is my basic waveform demo. This is something I show first year university students I, and it's, it's one of those first instant wins for them when they see, ah, look, there are signals, there are waves, you can do different things. Every flow graph ends up with a uh, block at the top called options. You can just leave that completely be. Next one down, you'll always have a variable called sample rate because digital signal processing knows nothing about what happened in the analog realm. It doesn't know what frequency you were tuned to. It doesn't know what, sam what rate these samples were acquired at. If you tell it, ah, I acquired this at one kilosample per second, it's going to sit there and go, this is a really slow signal. Uh, if you tell it, I acquired this at one billion samples per second, it's going to go, ah, you must be with the MOD. Uh, it doesn't care. It's going to do the same operation on the samples. It's just going to interpret it differently depending on the information you give it. We have two signal sources. They're both going to give us, in this case, cosine waves, but sine waves uh, at different frequencies. And then I'm going to introduce amplitude, phase, and frequency delays. And we're going to look at it, ooh, that's fun, on a spectrum plot. Um, this appears to seem like it'll mostly work. Uh, no, that's, that's not going to work at all. Zoom. So this is clearly just two half sine waves. Blue wave is zero, one. Uh, channel two is the red wave. Uh, and if I sit here and say, I want the frequency to be 15, ah, it turns out that like a, an oscilloscope, I'm triggering on wave zero. And so if wave two isn't at the same frequency, we're going to see it rolling and oscillating. Probably fairly familiar to anyone who's used uh, a two-input two oscilloscope. If I change the amplitude of that wave, 
to be 0 0.5. We can see now the red wave is a much lower amplitude. Let's stop it from scrolling. I'm going to go to frequency 32. This is now the second harmonic of the, the blue wave. So now uh, the triggering is, is keeping it stable. Uh, and so if I take this slider, now we can increase, we can decrease the sine wave amplitude, we can change the phase. There's some little glitches when you go in the other direction because you're actually violating causality. It, you're saying, ah, please introduce a negative time delay is, is how I'm dealing with the phase. And it goes, nuh -uh, that's, that's there's no samples, here's a zero, which is why you see the little spurs. Uh, but the fun thing is you can drop down these plots and you can investigate the behavior of each one of these blocks. You can go into them and you can say, you know, what's the sample rate? What waveform? Let's change that to be a sine wave. Um, we can see the frequency, the amplitude, the initial offset. You can't do a dynamic uh, phase tuning with this. You can go into the documentation. Uh, it's somewhat unhelpful. This isn't the latest version of the software. The newest one has a uh, website URL in the documentation that goes to an online document that is written for humans. <laughs> At least it's trying to be written for humans, so it's, it's a little bit easier to uh, understand what's going on. And particularly, the more complicated the block, the higher the chance you have somebody at some point has gotten confused enough to share some of their notes about the block, and that's ended up in the software. Um, so we have some basic stuff there. If we look up something a bit more uh, like an FM modulator, I, I think I still have plenty of time-ish. How long do I have? <coughs> I should probably wrap up quite soon then. Yes. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try and I'll jump straight to the next demo after this then. So we have a signal source. It's a sawtooth. So we're going to have a simulated voltage that's ramping from 0 up to 100 volts, maybe. Uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to, we have a voltage-controlled oscillator simulator here, which has a specific sensitivity in hertz per volt. Uh, and then we're going to look at it in the time and frequency domain. I'll just quickly run this. Uh, come on. So we can see our input voltage wave. We can see our VCO output. And we can see what it looks like in the frequency domain. As the voltage rises, the frequency rises. And you can see that in the spectrum plot. Basically, I'm just trying to illustrate. You can look at very fundamental concepts here. Or you can look at very complicated ones. Uh, because I did want to at least have one hardware demo. I'm just going to hit run on both of these. This is a narrowband FM transmitter. It includes all the audio processing with filters. It includes uh, low-pass filtering on the output after the modulation. And it goes out to hardware. Um, we are going to get two copies of the audio here, unfortunately, I think. The 400 megahertz ISM band and any band in between, MW0 LNA at the RSGB convention. So this is a recording of me MW0 last night. LNA. Uh, and we can see, basically, our radio has a tune option up there. It has a gain slider. We can see what our output spectrum is supposed to look like. We have a time domain signal of the, the audio. We have a frequency domain plot of the audio. This is the received spectrum. So we have a squelch, an RF gain, an RX frequency. We can see there's a really weak but noticeable FM signal in here. Uh, and so if I drop the squelch threshold down, we can see, ah, we have an audio signal down at the bottom um, and the time domain plot of the audio coming out the other side. This is a complete end-to-end -end narrowband FM implementation. Uh, I know I've essentially run out of time, so I'll throw up the last slide or so and say uh, all of these applications are open source, which means that you can go into all of the uh, source code. You can use it for any purpose. You can study it. You can look exactly at it. You can modify it to your needs. You can share it with your neighbors. And you can improve the program and, and release it to the public. Um, to find out more, uh, please do send me an email. Hit me up on Twitter. Find me here. Uh, and copies of my slides end up on on my website eventually. Thank you very much for your time. Sorry there isn't time for questions live. And uh, catch you in the hallways.
Thank you very much, Derek. Yes, we do have time for uh, some questions. 10 o'clock, we'll be uh, departing for coffee, so we can, uh, we can take 10 minutes of questions. Wonderful. Right, we'll start here in the front row. John, you have to wait. Yeah, I'll, sorry, I'll stay out of the... Yeah. The um, hi, Derek. Uh, my name's Michael, Mike Naylor, um, uh, G4CDF. I woke up with interest when you mentioned GNU Radio. I've used GNU Radio with a Lime SDR that my wife bought me for Christmas, aren't I lucky? And I've um, successfully implemented, though with some pain, a receiver for the QO100 satellite, and it locks onto the BPSK beacon, but I really, really struggled with GNU Radio to make a loop that would lock onto the beacon, and it needs manual initialization. What I'm wondering is how difficult is it to actually write your own blocks for GNU Radio uh, in Python? I've got a bit of Python experience, but I've fought shy of it so far. It's very simple to implement uh, custom DSP in a Python block. Um, clearly, we don't have enough time to actually illustrate what that looks like. But uh, if you look within your, Py within your installation, you can just drag and drop a Python block into the flow graph. We can see it has an input and an output and an example parameter. And if we go open an editor, uh, we can see it already has the default Python template. Anything that you do to the input items and then return as the output in this work function is your digital signal processing. So it's, it's drag and drop type easy if you have the background. Definitely. I'm familiar with your work, and I have it on my computer. Thank you. Next, John. That's not fair. John. No, no. This is this hey, is more. Cool sign, please. John G4BAO. Um, this is not really a question. It's a. Uh, it's. What processor are you running on that laptop to run GNU Radio and do transmit and receive? Just to get a handle on what machine is needed to run what you've just run. Sure. Uh, I bought this laptop in 2012. Uh, at the time, I did specifically wait uh, an extra couple weeks to buy it to get a, a reasonably snazzy one. Uh, these days, if you buy a laptop, it'll run GNU Radio and it'll do any of the kind of amateur radio bandwidth ones. Uh, the exception being things like DVB S2 and S2X. S2X is proving very difficult to do on a computer. Um, it is possible. People have done it, but it's, it's, it requires a very, very solid computer. I didn't hear a computer specification in that answer. Sorry. Minimum specification. They, this has a fourth generation Haswell Core i7 CPU uh, from Intel. It has uh, eight, 16 gigabytes of RAM, but that is not necessary. Neither of those are necessary for running the rates that most people here would run. I have run over 100 megahertz of bandwidth through this. So one. an i5 with four gigs would, would run that quite easily? Yes. The, it would run these examples. A Raspberry Pi would run these examples. Oh, okay. Um, it w probably wouldn't do digital video. No one else? There we go. Uh, uh, the man in green. Okay. Uh, Tony Abbey, G3OVH. Just a quickie. I keep seeing Python. I, I, I use Python, but I keep seeing Python 2 and Python 3. What's the difference and does it matter to GNU Radio and things like that? So Python 2 versus Python 3. Yes, it matters. As of next year, Python 2 is dead. It has been fa functionally dead in the water for years. Python 3 has been the new shiny version. They broke a lot of things, not very big things, but things that everybody had in their programs. And so the transition's been very slow. GNU Radio has a full Python 3 support and is actually Python 3 only in the next release. The current version works with Python 2 or 3. Um, just use Python 3 if you can in, in the future. Uh, just while the microphone's moving. The differences in coding in writing Python 2 and Python 3 are essentially zero. You just have to put a few new things in. Uh, so if you know Python 2, Python 3 is not scary. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, Richard, G4DYA. Um, I currently use Ubuntu 18.04. I'll stick with the LTS versions. Um, and that's got 3.7 in the Ubuntu packages for GNU Radio. 
which is, I think, about six years old now, is it? Now we've got 3.8 out. I'm just wondering, um, how, what's the best way these days of um, getting all the different packages to fit? Because we've got the Ubuntu package manager, we've got um, PIP, and the, there's Pi bombs and things like this. How, what's, what's the best way to sort of disentangle all, all these different dependency and packaging issues so you can get a coherent system that works? Sure. So this is basically an installation question uh, fairly specific to um, Linux, because Mac and Windows handle things differently. Uh, so Python, uh, so the GNU Radio 3.7 that's included with uh, Ubuntu 18.04 is actually quite recent. Um, our, main, our main maintainer is German, and so when he wrote the release announcement that made it into Radcom, uh, it got translated a little too literally, unfortunately. Um, and so there have been incremental updates. You're not very far behind. PyBombs is a build system and package manager that the GNU Radio project uses, and it will actually use apt. It'll use pip in the background. So if you use only PyBombs, you will end up with a consistent installation. If you use PyBombs and something else, things go crazy. So pick any one method and stick with that uh, is basically my answer. I use the apt installation when I can. That's the default operating system versions. And then when something isn't available, I download the source code and install that. Uh, and that will play nicely as long as you don't end up with two versions of the same thing on there. Yeah, uh, Andy Shaw, G1KXX. My question is, um, and it kind of follows on from the previous guys, is doesn't this lend itself beautifully to being implemented in, in uh, Docker? So there are, so Docker is a uh, way of taking your entire development environment, the entire environment of the software, all the dependencies, the external bits and pieces that aren't GNU Radio code itself, but all the things that GNU Radio uses. Uh, there are Docker installations. Uh, I don't personally use it. I find it a pain. Um, but that's because I'm not familiar with that tool set. I prefer manually managing everything especially because I'm doing daily development on two or three different versions of this, uh, which Docker probably would help me with, but uh, I, I'm familiar with just how to do it myself. There are Docker installations and Docker descriptions. It's actually what we use for all of our continuous integration testing, so you can download Docker files for all the release versions and all the supported operating systems. Well, thank you very much, Dick. What a fascinating lecture. Uh, could, uh, gentlemen, would you kindly put your hands together and show your appreciation?